Hello and welcome to another edition of Willow Talk to start the week. Adam Peacock alongside Brad Haddon. Bradley, how are you? And I'm good. I had a busy week, but I'm looking forward to talk to our next guest, actually, because hmm. not you talk about guys who score runs and take wickets, but this man's been doing it under pressure for the last three years. Yes, exactly. Um, we Our first podcast of the week at the moment, we're tending to catch up with someone uh, from the world of cricket, and this man has put himself in the frame for, for higher representative honours because he's been doing the business for his beloved state. He's from off the beaten track, a place called Snug, and his nickname is Slug. His real name is Bo Webster, and he joins us right now. <laughs> I'm not no, not sure if he's from Snug uh, directly as we speak right now, but Bo, he's on the, on the line. How are you, mate? I'm good. I'm glad you got that correct there in the end, Adam. Yeah, a place called mm. Snug down in uh, southern Tasmania, and um, yeah, Slug from Snug is what I get a little bit these days. So, um, no, nah, it's a lovely spot down there. Yeah, we'll get into all of that in a moment because I'm, I'm sure maybe people um, get them uh, reversed. I had a couple of cracks at it at the start of this recording um, right then, but got it right in the end. But first thing, Matt, we'll start with the cricket stuff because, man, have you had a couple of years, and it wasn't just last year where you, you picked up many accolades, uh, including Sheffield Shield Player of the Year, but the last three years you've been simply outstanding. Simple question, Why? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I suppose it comes down to a few things. I've obviously played a fair bit of first-class cricket now and, um, you know, back-to-back -back years of, of playing the same role down there when I've, I finally nailed down a spot, I think, is, has been a big part of it. I sort of started my career um, at the top of the order and, and floated between sort of one and, and four and then when I switched over to bowl, some medium paces, it was a bit tougher on the body and, and everyone thought it would be a better opportunity to, to cement the spot down at six and seven and, and bowl some overs. And um, I suppose that sort of clarity around the role and, and the way I play and, and sort of counter punch or, or get on with the game and try and drive it, I suppose, has held me in good stead. And um, yeah, it's been, a, been a, nice, a nice run of, of three years or so. But the one thing I've admired about your game, number six and seven can be a difficult place to to bat. You can come in at, at four for nothing or, or four for 300. But the one thing you've done well is you've been able to score runs under pressure and change momentum in the game. What, what's what been the big changing point there? Has it been technique? Has it been mindset? Yeah, I think a little bit of both. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to say uh, probably mindset is, is the biggest thing. Like you said, it's a, a bit of a position where you can come in um, in a multiple different scenarios. And um, I think it was... I don't like to give him too much credit, uh, Wadey, but he was a big one for me early when he when he first came down to Tassie and, um, you know, I had a look at my game and I was sort of floating around the top of the order and when we settled on uh, batting down at that six and seven spot, he, he sort of said it to me pretty bluntly that your, your defence is probably not your best part of the game and you are a free-flowing free kind of batter and um, he sort of said something to me about get them before they get you and that sort of mindset has stuck with me um, a lot batting at six and seven and it can help... Um, you know, when the, the bowlers are coming into their second or third spell, if we're off to a good start, or um, you do have to play a bit of a counter punch and, and try and get some runs on the board and start bowling while it is still moving around a bit, particularly at Bell Reeve, where it can uh, be a very new ball wicket. So that, that sort of mindset has always stuck with me and something I still, you know, take into the game today. I, I find that hard to believe that a, uh, a wicket keeper who, let's face it, it doesn't quite reach six foot, um, has an aggressive <laughs> mindset, would say, something borderline confrontational like that. Um, I, I can't think of anyone else that I can think of who I know like that, Bo. Well, it's funny, Bo, because when you are talking there, I was just saying, how well does Wadey read the game? That's what I was thinking. So you, we can take things either way. But <laughs> Bo, just having a look at the start of the summer, you obviously have a big pre-season, you play over in England, and you get your head around, okay, let, let's get things right for Tassie. Then all of a sudden, the test spot opens up. Hard not to think about it. Yeah, there's obviously a fair bit of noise around the place at the moment with, with Big Cam going down and going to fix his back and in some surgery, so he's going to be out for a while. And, um, you know, he's such an important player and, and bats, bowls and fields and leaves a, a massive hole in that Australian team. But, um, yeah, there is plenty of noise of who's going to replace and, and what are they going to do at the top of the order or in the middle order and all-rounder and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it is pretty hard to ignore any of it. But at the end of the day, I think I've, I've played enough cricket now to sort of just go about my business and um, stick to a routine that I have done in the last three or four years and held me in good stead in, in shield cricket. And, um, you know, I just want to keep making hundreds and taking wickets uh, for Tasmania and 
big believer in, you know, the more success you have for your state is, is also a highlight to play um, higher honours as well. So first and foremost is, is trying to rectify a, a Shield final loss for Tassie and get us back into that Shield final again. And if something does come along the way at higher honours, I think I'll be, um, you know, well adjusted to, to grab with both hands and try and, um, yeah, jump all over it. Obviously, a few in the frame for whatever position might come up, and there's a possibility of something in the middle order coming up um, with the reshuffling of how they're going to shape that uh, Australian batting order. But having a look at numbers, um, you you put yourself in the frame with this. You ended the 2020-21 season with 135 not against WA at the Wacker. Since then, the next season, 361 runs at 52, six wickets at 55. Uh, The one after that, nearly 600 runs at 43, 19 wickets at 44. And last season, nearly 1,000 runs, 959 at 60, three tonnes, 30 wickets at 31, won the Shield Player of the Year. That, to me, Hads, says, yes, that puts you in the frame if you do that in state cricket. Oh, well, what it does is, is it shows that, that you're improving on your game every year. And, and that's the one thing at state cricket. Y- yes, you have some guys that come in and, and it, it can be tough, and, and Bo, probably the same for you. It's tough when you, you start your career, but then you start to get a bit of um, momentum, understand how your style of play works and fits into the team. But you, you want to keep improving every year, and that's the one thing I think you're doing really well in your game. Yeah, no doubt. I think um, if I cast my mind back to when I first came into Shield Cricket, I think I scored back-to-back hundreds in game five or five and six, one at the MCG and one at the Gabba. Um, and that was early on in my career. I must have been 20, 21 years old. And since then, I've had, I think the biggest knock on me has been my inconsistency. I'll, you know, I score one or two hundreds a year, but they'll be few and far between with a lot of low scores. Um, in and amongst that, and I try to rectify that, like you said, by going to England and just continuously playing and learning, learning in different conditions and trying to, uh, improve on my weaknesses. And, and I think more importantly, really capitalize on my strengths and, um, I feel like in the last sort of three to four years, um, that consistency of, of spotting the team and, and as well as being an all-rounder bowling some overs is, is also massive for my game. I feel like a, a quite a competitive bloke and if I'm not getting any runs, I can um, contribute to the team with the ball. So, um, yeah, that sort of clarity over role and, um, you know, going to England and playing in a bit of franchise cricket and some four-day cricket over there and the Champo stuff is, is hugely beneficial and, and I want to play as much as I can and, um, at this age, I, I'm 30 now. I just want to keep playing and, um, you know, keep driving, driving my standards and keep trying to put runs on the board and, and take as many wickets as I can. Yeah, we've we've noticed that franchise cricket. Your, your Instagram reel has thrown up a photo that I will quiz you on a bit later <laughs> on um, pertaining to. A, looks like you guys are having a good time. And Chris Lynn's in the photo. So, yeah, that, that might explain a little bit right there. <laughs> but we'll get to that a bit later on. I did note that... Um, a former teammate of yours, Tasmania, happens to be the chief Australian selector right now, George Bailey. Um, do you have anything on George that you can use as leverage in this situation? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish. I, if, I, if I do think back to earlier on when I was uh, playing with George in the latter part of his career, he's, uh, he's a great guy and a, um, a funny guy and he loves to entertain Bale, so I'm sure I can come up with something along the lines if I did have to hold him to ransom down the track, but he's... Um, no, I have a good relationship with George. He always comes out for a beer whenever he's in the same state as the as the Tassie boys and catch up. And um, I think it's I think the best thing is we don't really talk too much cricket when he's there. It's more about um, everything else, and he, he feels like he's just one of the lads again. So he's a great bloke, um, Bales. And um, no, I've had a lot of respect for him in his career, and obviously into the selector role now. I don't want to I don't want to pump him up too much, but no, I, I enjoyed playing with him. And um, you know, if there is a little bit of bias towards the Tasmanian, I certainly wouldn't be uh, afraid to take it. A little story about George, my first encounter with George Bailey. Um, it was a bit late on in his career. It was really late on in his career because that's what the story's about. Walked out there and I'd never met the guy before and I walked out, g'day George, um, Adam Peacock, I'm calling the game today for Fox, blah, blah, blah. And the first thing he said to me, he goes, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> He was done. He was he was caught. He was finished. And I went, oh, okay. Well, that's a guy who speaks his mind right there. But unfortunately, I brought that day up because I think that's that day at North Sydney Oval where you were wearing him uh, as earrings. Um, I don't know if you remember that. You you caught one in the uh, the region that really really hurts and um, happened to be in commentary with Kerry O'Keefe and we both found it very amusing. But th- does that sound like George um, saying something like that? He's he's to the point and. 
to the further to the question, has he actually told you along the journey about what exactly you need to be working on? No, that does definitely sound like George. He's, uh, I think if we can just watch his batting stance at the back end of his career or any any part of his career, I think he's gone from being Shiv Chanderpaul to, to going completely the other way throughout his career. But he still managed to score a run somehow, so uh, I've got a bit of respect for that. But um, no, in terms of the, the conversations with him, I haven't had a hell of a lot to, to do with him as he's been a selector. I've just... Um, you know, sort of going about in business down here and, um, you know, let, let my bat or, or wickets do the talking. And I'm sure if if a spot did open up and there was a, a spot in a test squad, I'd, I'd, I'd love to receive the call from him uh, personally. But no, no, nothing along the lines of what you need to do. I think it's pretty clear in, in domestic cricket, the more runs you can make and the more um, wickets you can take, I think it speaks for itself. And um, that's just what I'm trying to do. Yeah, kind of uh, yeah, crystal clear way of looking at things. Hads, did you ever see, guys, the meaner change when selectors all of a sudden... We mentioned it last week, but when you see a selector in the vicinity or they come into the change room or you catch up with them, guys, like, walk up to them and, you know, they can't help themselves. They just go, Kiss oh, their oh ass. Yeah, 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 pick me. Yeah, that kind of thing. Mate, it was interesting. It's And Bo's in the position at the moment and obviously hasn't changed. He started the summer well. But when there's a test spot up for grabs, sometimes you think, it can do too much. You can try to say, oh, I've got to change my game. I've just scored runs here. But the the one thing Bo's done, he's gone out and got 113. But what I want to ask about, strain A. Um, mate, how, how do you approach a, a game like that? Because, yes, you want to perform more, but it's still about finding a way to beat India before the summer starts. Yeah, it's a, a bit of a tricky one, the Aussie selection. There's obviously a lot of chat around the opening spot and, and who's going to replace Cameron Green and what they do there. So I'm sure everyone who's been selected in that team has has got some part of their mind on um, what they can do to, to stand out from the pack and um, be a little bit selfish, I suppose, with a big hundred or some big wickets or whatnot. But yeah, like you said, it's a, a lot easier to perform in a team that's going well and, and winning. So I'm sure that the first and foremost, the boys want to get the job done over in over India um, early in the summer and give the Aussie boys a, a good start to what is a huge summer. So, um, no, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a good challenge, I think. Um, my game certainly won't change to what I've been what I've been doing in the last few years. I'll, I imagine I'll be in the same sort of role um, with both bat and ball and, um, yeah, that clarity over that, I certainly won't be changing anything too much. And, yeah, hopefully I can uh, put, some more, put some more numbers on the board. Shield victories for Tasmania, few and far between, but you, you do have three oh. since entering the competition in 1970. What? He's a New South Welshman through and through. When's He's very last... biased. Um, when, did the... <laughs> when, was, the... when 20... was the last time New South Wales actually won a Shield final? We're talking to Bo. Yeah, I know we're talking to Bo. However, <laughs> Bo, you went close. What my question was that they performed above expectation last season, Hads, and got themselves to a final. Didn't quite work out there at the Wacker where... WA just ground you in the dirt, unfortunately. But is that how big a motivating factor is that to Tasmanian cricket? Well, let's face it, you're always the underdog down there. Um, you can serve up a green top, especially early in the season down there, which <laughs> brings a sparkle to your eye, no doubt. But how much is that a driving motivating factor when you guys would have gone back to pre-season training? I don't know if you were there because you look to be elsewhere on your Instagram feed, but um, going back to training in the middle of winter to try and do something great for Tassie cricket. Yeah, we, we, we did stumble at the final hurdle. I think the, the game before probably hurt us more uh, against South Australia at home where we, we certainly back ourselves to beat uh, anyone down there on, on our conditions. And um, unfortunately, we got, you know, we rolled up a wicket that was probably a little bit too green. And, um, you know, it's, it's on the knife's edge down there with the toss. You can either, you can either win the toss and bowl and um, chase anything in the fourth innings and, um, other times, if you win the toss and bowl, you can create divots and it becomes a really, really tough battle to score runs in the fourth inning. So it's an interesting shield wicket, no doubt. Um, and I think we stumbled in that final hurdle. And like I said, it was always going to be tough over there against the Globetrotters WA. So, um, no, it's a massive, a massive driving factor for everyone. I know our skipper Silky's, um, you know, he's on what you could almost call him a passionate Tasmanian now. He's been there for 12 years. He's our captain. Um, I know you guys wouldn't like to say that since he hails from the Blue Mountains, but he's, uh, as Tassie as they get now and he, he's a really good leader for our group. And, um, you know, he had a good season himself last year along with, 
a couple of others that really stood out in uh, our seam attacking. Gabe Bell and, and Lawrence Neil Smith were, were outstanding with the ball and, and put us into a, a really good position most times where we can um, you know use our strength, which is our batting, and, and chase down uh, targets. Um, we obviously went with quite a different makeup too, with sort of three all rounders. Two genuine quicks and a spinner last year to sort of lengthen our batting, which is something um, you know I certainly was a bit surprised with early when I got back from England the, uh, the previous season, and we sort of just all bought into it, and it seemed to be working where we were, um, you know, we had really faith in the batting group that we could chase down anything, and um, you know it showed a couple of times where we chased 400 plus um, with a long batting order, and um, I think we'll go to a similar model, maybe not every game this year, but we'll certainly use it again uh, at some stage. Just one before we. Um, in this cricket segment, this hardened cricket chat, um, before getting on some of the fun stuff in our in our second seg. But you're bowling, so you you've bowled offies. You can bowl medium pace. Have you ever done the ultimate party trick and gone one ball of one, one ball of another, like for six deliveries in a row in a game? I don't think it's six deliveries in a row, but I've certainly bowled a couple of big bash games where. Um, particularly the MCG where I was bowling to two left-handers to a big side, I would, I'd bowl off spin if there's you know if there's a little bit of spin there, and then if it was the right-handers to the short side, I'd switch back to medium pace. And um, the offies still do come out every now and again. I'm I'm more of a, a seam all-rounder now, but um, no, I bowled some last week in the Shield when they had two left-handers there, and there was a a little bit of spin at the Junction Oval. Um, that's all it offered that wicket, but it was a um, they're still there, uh, the offies, and I'm, I'm super glad I, I took up medium pace because they were pretty dusty, the offies, for a bit there. It's actually interesting. The, le- the less you bowl part-time off spin, the better they become, I think. So um, I don't bowl them too many times in the nets. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, but, no, they're still there if I need them. It's nice to be able to wheel them out if we do have a couple of lefties, and we've obviously got Matt Kuhneman down here now tearing the ball the other way. So it's nice mm-hmm. to have that option if we do go to a, a dry pitch. But isn't there a story about Jake Doran getting picked over you to bowl mediums on a Gabba green top? Uh, he, he, I don't think he got... It wasn't a Gabba, it was a Bell Reeve. He actually nicked off Sam Whiteman too, so I've got to give him some credit there. But he was, uh, it was an absolute green seamer, and for some reason, I think one of our quicks might have gone down and, and Dorsey ended up... He was in the field at the time. Wade, must have been keeping, and he bowled a couple of balls, and, and they actually did a little bit at Bell Reeve, and I thought... If this is if this bloke can take a wicket here, then surely I can, I can, and um, that was pretty much the catalyst right before COVID to take it up and actually do it properly, <laughs> as opposed to just grabbing a new ball out of the wrapper. Um, and actually, yeah, had to actually had a proper crack at it where I, um, you know, had a full pre-season under Griffo and did a bit of gym work and, and technical stuff to actually be able to bowl it, and it sort of just grew from there. Fair enough. And speaking of growing, you are over two hundred centimeters. We had Cam Green on earlier this year. Uh, we had a Do You Play Basketball segment where basically we just talk, talk <laughs> things tall because producer Sam, he, he hits his head on the, uh, the the frame of the door when he walks into places as well. Um, it, what's the biggest struggle in your day-to-day life? Pants that fit, bed that's mm, long enough? Yeah, the, 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 door frame get, always. the door frame gets me, especially I've noticed it particularly in England where every door frame seems to be about 180 centimetres and um, I feel like an absolute <laughs> giant in that country ducking under... Old English house doorways, but um, yeah, I, I can't really think of it. Other than the fact that everywhere you go, somebody says, geez, you're tall, when you don't really have a response to it. I'm sure Greeny gets it all the time as well. <laughs> sort of just, you sort of just nod. I'm so sick of it now. You just sort of nod yeah. at him and, and uh, move on. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really sharp observation when you look at someone going, <laughs> if you're tall, anyway. <laughs> but with, with, with success comes opportunity as well. And, and I see you, you've been over playing county cricket. Uh, you, you're playing in leagues around the world. You, you're learning much. Is it been a beneficiary to your game to, to be able to go overseas and, and see different conditions? Yeah, 100%. I, I took an enormous amount out of um, Gloucestershire this year. We, we and I was over there predominantly for the T20 Blast, but I ended up going a little bit early and, and took the opportunity to play, um, I think it was four four-day fixtures over there with the Dukes ball, um, and mainly bowling, I think, more so with the with the Dukes ball, which I haven't done a hell of a lot with, um, and, and swinging that around and learning how to bowl, you know, different deliveries with that was was probably the biggest learning curve. And um, I really enjoyed it. They're, they're a great bunch of lads over there. It's a good city, Bristol. And, um, and you know, everything I got out of the blast and, and the batting stuff as well with the four-day cricket, it was, I think it was more of a bowling learning curve more than anything. And 
um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I love to get back every winter if I could and, and play as much as I can. It's I really enjoy the the English summer. It's a it's a very fun one, and um, you know they play a lot more than they train, which has always been um, you know my yeah. goal as well. So <laughs> um, I love that side of things as well. It's, it was good. Hey, well, we're going to take a short spell here on Willow Talk with Bo Webster. They're going to be back in a moment to talk about all the other fun things around cricket, about seeing the world, about some of the players and and great. Um, captains and people that you've met along the way and where you grew up as well. A little bit of the backstory with Bo Webster and more about that picture with Chris Lynn and a very, very famous DJ. Back in a sec. Here with Bo Webster. So, Bo, tell us, like, to the uninitiated, if you need to sell... You're, okay, you're CEO of the Tourist Bureau of Snug, which is just south (laughs) of Hobart. Sell the place to us, mate. Should we go and visit and take a little trip just south of Hobart there to check it out? Gee, it's a, it's a tough sell. It is a tough sell because there's not a hell of a lot going on there, to be honest with you. But they do have uh, an excellent butcher, which I used to uh, visit frequently with my mum when we were going to get our, our meat for the week. Um, yeah. They've got an excellent excellent footy ground, which is called the Salmon Pen. Obviously, uh, <laughs> Tassau Salmon comes from just up the road there as well, the, the, the beautiful salmon down there. So... The Salmon Pen's a lovely place for a beer and, a, and an arvo of watching local footy down there. Um, and I've got a snug tavern as well, which I reckon I had my first schooner out there at some stage um, in my life as well. Yeah, I'm not, I, I, it was definitely pre-18 if I started to get myself in too much trouble, but uh, it's a good country pub. And um, I think a lot of my mates from down that way still uh, lob in there on a, on a Friday after the tools and, and get stuck into a few. Yep, any 14-year-olds out there, head down to the Snug Tavern and they'll sort you out. So there you go. Well, Bo, Bo was probably about 190 centimetres. No, I'm not saying that, by the way. Maybe go down for a, a Coke Zero or a Pink Lemonade or something like that and uh, go down there with your parents and they'll enjoy a pint. What do they call it down there? Pint, pot, whatever it is. Um, but, mate, what was it for you growing up? Was it cricket and who were the idols or was it, like, down there? You mentioned the footy ground. I'd imagine you got the build for footy, so you would have played a bit of that in your time. Yeah, definitely, definitely cricket in the summer, footy in the winter, like most uh, young lads in Australia. We we Bell Reeves, the, the obviously the hub for Premier Cricket in Tassie, and that's about a 30, 30 minute drive, thirty five minute drive from Snug to there. So my old man would you know get in the car after a day's work on Tuesdays and Thursdays and take me to under twelves or fifteens or whatever it was, um, southern southern rep teams and things like that. So I owe him a huge amount of. Um, you know, K's in the old Udy hat. I think he had this old Rodeo with two seats in it. Me and my brother used to pile into it and go to training. So I, I do owe him a lot of a lot of love for the first um, part of my ju- junior career. But played a lot of footy as well for um, ch- it was called Channel Football Club, which they play out of the Salmon Pen. Um, they're folded now, unfortunately. So they only got a junior club, and then I moved up into the um, into the Big Smoke, if you would, in uh, in Mount Nelson, which is about five minutes out of the city, and um, yeah, went to went to Hobart College and, and continued to play footy and cricket right up until uh, I think I got a phone call when I was playing for uh, the Tassie Mariners and from Michael Farrell, who was the high performance manager at the time, and said, we want to give you a, a ridiculously massive contract rookie deal for about $16,000 a year. And I um, pretty much threw the footy boots out right away and, um, and packed up and went down and, and started training the next week, I think. I guess you always had to remember your first contract, don't you? The yeah. first time someone mentions you, we are going to pay you to play cricket. 1500 1500 Full stake contract. <laughs> That's what he's on per episode here, Bowie, by the way. But full stake contract, 1500 for the yeah. season. Yep. How good. Gee and you whiz. thought that was a king's ransom? Life changing, I thought it was. I thought <laughs> it was the best day of my life. <laughs> May remember when your old man used to say to you, mate, you're going to have to get a job. Sport's not going to pay. But as soon as your contract comes, you say, mate, I got the contract. It's irrelevant what the number <laughs> was. Right. Got, you off a, got you off a building site with the old man hats. Yeah. Well. Who were the idols? I'm, I'm guessing it was someone from Tasmania as a, as a cricketer. I've got a fair idea who it might be. Yeah, it was. I, I think my first year in the, in the squad, Ricky was still around. And he was obviously the, the biggest of big deals in Australian cricket. And he was, you know, just had an aura around him when he was um, training at, training with us. Tazzy boy, so he was always um, one I looked up to. But I'd say in terms of idols, I had a, a really good relationship. I still do have a really good relationship with Alex Dool and um, he's a financial advisor now at the moment, so he actually looks after some some of my stuff there. But we still catch up regularly, and um, he's been a great life mentor and cricket mentor and everything uh, for me. 
so he's a massive one I'd have to mention. And then um, obviously Wadey, who I mentioned before as well, who's been huge since he moved back from Victoria and, and sort of captained us and um, dominated and got himself back into the test team and things like that. So those two were, were huge for me, um, you know, when I first sort of got into the team and, and then a bit later when Wadey came down. So two idols um, who, I, who I still, you know, spend a lot of time with today, it would be those two. And you've also had the opportunity to, to play with a, a few superstars of the game. You, you played with Stuart Broad. You've also had the opportunity to uh, get your cap given by by Senga. Um, what what do you learn by by watching those guys, or does it just reinforce that the stuff you're doing is right? Yeah, it was a uh, um, you know that was a, a fair while ago now when I was still at the Hurricanes, and we had Kumar and, and Broadie rotate through there as well as a, a couple of other big names. Um, you know, Alex Hales was down there at the time as well. Um, and then when I suppose I moved to the Renegades, it, 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 there was another set of superstars, Finch and um, you know Maxwell around the place at the stars. Of these guys who were who were big white ball superstars and um, it did feel a little bit different. When my first contract with the Renegades I actually got traded for Wadey when he wanted to come back to the Hurricanes and I was a bit embarrassed in that own right, getting traded for you know someone who'd played X amount of games for Australia and a, and a bit of a superstar and here I was, a, a bloke from Snug who hadn't really played any cricket outside of Tasmania and, and moved over to Melbourne and um, that in itself was a, a massive... Um, point in my career and learnt so much and so grateful for that opportunity to be to be over there in Melbourne and um, still there obviously at the Melbourne Star so that was um, that was excellent but then and more recently I suppose in, in some of these franchise comps I've, I've played with David Warner in the last couple um, a few other guys who are on the white ball circuit now AJ Tyre um, and a couple of other guys who were who were predominantly white ball um, Globe trotters, I suppose, if you want to call them or whatever, for lack of a better word. But no, it's 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 been a good journey, and definitely, um, you know, Davey was a big one. He's I never really had anything to do with Davey prior to this winter, and um, since then he's he's um, you know we still stay in contact, and he always sends me a message. He did the other day after the the hundred and, and things like that. So it's nice to meet these sort of big names along the way and um, connect with them and play a bit of golf with them, which is probably the best way to get to know them. I've heard that about Warner. He can sort out a game of golf, um, but he's energetic. Certainly, he's, there's always something going on. Is, is there? It's good fun. Is there an off switch? It's with good David fun. Warner? It is good fun. Or I didn't see it. I certainly didn't see the off switch in the last month. Um, <laughs> he was he, like he said. He's he's high paced and and he. I think he wanted to play golf. You know, every single day. And whilst we we're in Canada, we I think we played five or six out of the top 10 courses and I, you know, I didn't make a single phone call. I just lobbed up with my clubs and put him <laughs> in the back of his car and away we went. So he was excellent on tour and he's a great tour ops um, to have in your team and I've been, I, I took advantage of it, no doubt. It did cost me a couple of times when he beat me a few times and made me front up with a shirt or a, or a box of Pro-V ones, but it was well worth it. Mate, he's the fixer. He, he could like have the best travel company in the whole world, this <laughs> he, bloke. He is great on a long tour. Incredible. Incredible. Hey, um, Bo, just back to Stuart Broad. Just want to take a few steps back. So play with him at Hobart Hurricanes. So when you're kicking back wherever you were around the world um, at that Ashes series um, that happened um, not that long ago, and it all blew up, and Stuart Broad starts taking the high road, and <laughs> us as fans, we've got this relationship with Stuart Broad where we like to see him fail. Let's be honest, and we didn't like it when he was tearing through us. But you know him as a bloke, so you're seeing that theatre play out. How did you relate to it in the Stuart Broad that you know, who helped you in your career, and I, I would say I'm guessing, like kind of chaperoned you through the early stages of playing that BBL stuff. Yeah, it was it was interesting. That they, he was villain number one after he was, you know, tearing into us about the, you know the code of the game and all these things and into Kez about the, the run out and, you know, the footage. I was seeing one footage of Kez running out, Johnny, and then the next footage would be of Stuart Broad nicking one to first slip and, and standing there. It was a bit of a um, <laughs> interesting sort of videos going around there. But I don't know him personally, Stuart. I was quite young at the Hurricanes um, at that stage and other than sort of hanging around him at a pub or nightclub trying to see what he was about there. I didn't spend too many too many times with him. Um, I think I only played with him maybe, you know, less than five or six games. So um, 
No, he was good one. I will, I will give him. He was super when he was around the Hurricanes. He was. Um, I remember speaking to Bales, and and you know we all had the same sort of idea about Stuart Broad. And then you, you share a dressing room room with him, and and it all changes when you sort of get to know a bloke. So he was fantastic yeah. uh, in the dressing room. Matt, I, I just enjoyed there going through some of the the good mentors that you played with Warner, um, AJ, Ty, Broad. You didn't mention Linny. As a mentor. As a mentor. You must have had a good time, <laughs> you and Linny. Yeah, Linny's, Linny's a bit like David. There's not much off switch there, especially when he's away uh, away on tour. We had a, a couple of good nights in, well, more than a couple, uh, good nights away in, in Canada where um, there was a bit, fair bit of rain around and um, there was some yeah t- some times to fill in and we ended up having uh, a couple of <laughs> evenings I'll never forget. But he's, uh, he's like David. His contact list off the field will be... Something to behold, I reckon. He always seems to have someone in some spot who can uh, help you out. So he was he was excellent. I, I have known Lenny a bit more uh, personally than I have Davey uh, over the years, and, and we've always got on well. We both enjoy beer and um, talk cricket and talk talk things off field and stuff, and he's always been uh, excellent for me. And in Canada, it felt like we just picked up where we never left off, and away we went. <laughs> so there's this photo. Bo Webster, a view with Chris Lynn, who has obviously taken the photo. Uh, I reckon that's Ashton Agar at the back there. You, yourself yep. in it. And Benny there's a gentleman Menendez. with a pair of glasses that, I don't know, your grandma might have worn in the 1960s, and he's got a bucket <laughs> hat on. He's got his trademark <laughs> smile on his face. It's Fisher, the DJ, the madman from Gold Coast. He's, he, I think Loose Unit is in the Urban Dictionary, and a, there's a picture of him in it. Um, he's world. He's like he plays to packed houses all around the place, and he's just this ex surf from the Gold Coast who's just fallen into a, a career DJing. He's become this global superstar. Tell us about the night out with him. It looks like you've spent a bit of time with him, if you can remember it. I I can remember it because I actually had to play the next day at ten o'clock with the uh, Brampton boys, and those boys who were in that photo I had the day off the next day, so I had to. I had to watch myself a little bit, but it was. Uh, I'll run you through the story as quick as I can. We were sort of sitting there, and Linny sends out a text message saying, "Oh, do you want to go to Fisher on Friday night? He's playing at a festival just up the road." And um, I was sort of like, "Yeah, absolutely." He said, and all I heard from him is, "I'll sort, I'll sort it out." And I thought, "Okay, no worries." And gets to Friday, and the boys are having a few beers in the in the uh, bar downstairs before they go, and. We go up to Linny's room and have a few more and whatnot. And um, I said, "Oh, what are we doing with these tickets? Are we are we just in the general admin, or are we, you know, on stage with him, or what have you got for us, Linny? I don't actually know what you can sort out." And he goes, "Haven't actually got the tickets yet, mate. I'm still working on it." I was like, oh, "Okay, no worries. We'll we'll, we'll keep going." And then uh, we get in the, we we actually walk down the hotel in the hotel bar, and, and a lot of my teammates are sitting there having dinner, and I'm walking out in a bit of a festival kit, and they're going, "What are you doing? We've got a game tomorrow." <laughs> And I said, don't worry, I'm just looking after these two so they don't get uh, off the chain too much. And anyhow, we get in the Uber and we get to the festival and there's still no tickets and we're sort of sitting around, not sure what we're doing. And then all of a sudden, Linny has a few conversations with people at the festival and next thing we know, we're um, pretty much on stage or as close to as you can get on stage. And halfway through, Fisher's set, he sort of spots Linny down there and uh, he starts throwing, pretends to throw up a cricket ball and, and start hitting it on stage while he's performing, which is... <laughs> Pretty outrageous, and then as he walked off stage, he sort of no, he saw Linny and just said, "Give me five minutes and come back into our trailer and we'll have a couple of beers." And um, me, Benny Menenti, um, Ash Agar, and Tim Seifert as well was there. Was sort of a bit taken back, and we spent you know the best part of an hour just having a seltzer or two with Fisher, which we could hardly believe in his trailer. I think that night he was flying back off to Ibiza or something like that. So it was a bit of a whirlwind, but. Um, I actually shelled one at second slip the next day too, which wasn't great. Davey gave me a uh, not a good look, and uh, he sort of th- said, "I know what you've been up to last night. And you've, you've shelled. I think I shelled Shaky Balasan too, so he had the danger to win the game for him. But luckily, we we ended up winning, and I got a few um, to get us over the line. So all was forgotten. Hey, wouldn't have wouldn't have thought when you had that first beer in snug that that's where it could lead. But um, I want to know then: is Chris Lynn approaching Dave Warner? Off-field curricular, extracurricular activities, organisational qualities. 
Not even is he, close. Is he vying or is he like in the same league? Oh, Davey's, Davey's in a league of his own with his with his contacts, but Linny would, would certainly have a, a fair one of his own. He, he seems to know, like I said with Davey, he seems to know people everywhere or people know him. He's quite recognisable with his with his bald head. I think he was actually caught telling everybody that he was Fisher's brother that night and um, that got him enough <laughs> attention <laughs> anyway. So, um, no, nah, they're, they're, both, they're both very good, like I said. If you've got a long tour, they're both very good to have uh, on, on the troop. The, these two players I've mentioned um, aside, Hads, who's the one that springs to your mind in your day who was the, the great fixer of, you know, if something needed sort and if the boys wanted to go out and have a good time, who who generally got ahead of it? Well, in my day, hmm. whoever was 12th man, it didn't matter who it was. <laughs> you, you had an obligation to make sure you'd organise things. But David Warner's new level. Yeah. I, I remember um, being in IPL and you, you had uh, only sections you were allowed in, but some way he found a way to get a magic piece of rope to, to go around a section and COVID didn't come in, but it happened to be around a bar. <laughs> Mate, uh, he was a ge- <laughs> he was a genius. So when everyone's yeah. whinging about COVID, David Warner had a, a little roped area off where we, we might've been able to see other people, but I tell you what, that rope, he solved it. He was outstanding. I, I reckon Brendan Julian's pretty good as well. Uh, the, he's got a good contact book. George Bailey was good. George Bailey. Yep. Mm. He, can you verify any of this, Bo? Yeah, ba- Bales was always first one out of the hotel and into the pub and sorting stuff out for the boys or dinners or whatever it may be. He was he was excellent in his day. Mm, yes. Probably still is. He still, do- well, he still does that for the selectors. He <laughs> <laughs> does that sort of selection board. Oh, dear. Uh, mate, what what about playing over in, in county cricket? Um, so Essex and Gloucestershire. Oh, look, Essex is a, it's a very distinct part of of England. What, what did you pick up there in your time? Um, and I'm not just talking about the cricket, I'm just talking about lifestyle and, and all of those things. Cause, um, you can enjoy yourself in that, uh, in that part of London. Yeah, certainly very enjoyable there. They're very, two different experiences, my Essex time and my, and my Gloucester time, both, both very good. Um, I got in there. I actually got in that one day. I was playing, I only played the one days for Essex and just happened to know their assistant coach, Mark Bettini, who played a lot of cricket over for, um, Leicestershire and Essex. And he's their, he's their assistant coach now. He was actually the team manager at, uh, the Renegades when I first got there. Really good mates with Andrew McDonald. And, um, he's sort of the one who, him and Mick Lewis, who's the assistant there now, sort of got me into the one day team and, they sort of said all our all our big boys are at the hundred. Come and come and play some cricket, and um, yeah, it was a very very good off field experience. They know how to enjoy themselves, the Essex boys, and it was quite a good mix of young up and comers, and then a few older guys in uh, Jamie Porter and, and Simon Harmer, who sort of played um, who don't play in the hundred. So it was it was a very enjoyable time, and uh, yeah, lovely part. I, I didn't I lived with one of the guys there, Aaron Beard, as well. So he was he was looking after me for the for the summer over there as well, and. He's a great guy. Um, and then, yeah, last year at, at Gloucestershire was a bit different where I actually got signed before I went over there and, um, you know, was, was really looking forward to the blast and the four-day cricket and what I spoke about before was, um, you know, they're both very different but very enjoyable clubs to be at. Okay. Uh, nickname as well, uh, Slug. Can you mm. clear up how that came about? And also a listener asks where the nickname The Masterpiece comes from. <laughs> <laughs> That's an absolute <laughs> stitch up. Um, <laughs> how do I go about this? Uh, yeah, the slug nickname was just one that a, a, a wicket keeper actually had. So Brady Jones is my plays my club down at Kingborough, and I, I reckon him. I was about I reckon I was about eleven or twelve, maybe maybe a little bit older. And I was running into bowl, and I some for some reason I I didn't have any underwear on. I just had my training shorts on and. Um, I think I had it, <laughs> and he said he, he said I could see your slug running in when I when you when you bowling to me, and that and that's literally how it started. And ever since then, it can uh, it just stuck with me. Um, the masterpiece one is I'll I'll let that one go through to the keeper, but um, yeah, the the slug one is just it's definitely stuck, and I think more people yeah. you know still call me slug than they will, ever would bow, which is I've I've got no problem with. Uh, you're a brave human being to go free balling in Tasmania, but um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what I was thinking there. Got some more listener questions, Bo. Uh, here we go, yeah. Yeah, okay. Listener questions. Tell us about Galaxy in Perth on away trips. <laughs> uh, just an excellent um, karaoke place, actually. It's a, uh, you can have a bit of Chinese food and sing some songs too after a, after a nice shield victory, hopefully, over there after a long week. 
What's your go-to? It's karaoke. karaoke. Mm. Oh, gee, I'm I'm not really the man. I think Charlie Wakem's our go-to. He's a bit of a muso, and he's he takes the reins. Big chuck. He's uh, excellent off field as well. We actually have quite a good off field contingent at Tassie, which is I think contributing some of our on field success, no doubt. I wonder if it's as good as Michael Bevan and his guitar. Mate, Michael Slater, he was very good. Brett Lee, mm. Shane Lee, we we had good fun at karaoke as well. Also, we were you interviewed by Swans coach John Longmire? <laughs> I I did have a sit down with Sydney at some stage when I was pretending to be a footballer and I sort of put a bit of mail <laughs> on it now. About how how John said he would have taken me in the second round if I'd have gone in the draft, but that's certainly some tax. That was in the period there where they were just drafting anyone who was tall, even if they couldn't play football, and I was somehow in that category. Um, <laughs> but I like to hard. tell like to tell everyone that I was, uh, I was if I had a chose football, I could have been in the Swans under under Horse Longmire. But there was a conversation like this is not. I did, yeah, I did sit down with. No, nah, it's not a complete fabrication. You do those interviews with the, uh, the the draftees, and I was I was yeah sat down with the Swans for all of about half an hour. I think. That would have been interesting with the slug and horse going coming into bolt. <laughs> slug and horse <laughs> could have could have been a nice duo <laughs> there in Sydney. Okay, uh, one li- one listener says he sat next to you at a wedding last month. He caught COVID, yet you said you didn't. Are you a human marvel, or does whiskey and wine <laughs> kill COVID? <laughs> That's the question. And you can name this exactly. person because you're obviously not. I know exactly who that is, Kane Richardson. We sat at uh, Tom, we're at Tom Andrews' wedding in Adelaide. And um, yeah, I, I, for some reason, he said he got sick, as did a lot of the other wedding, and I was, I was good to go. I, I certainly indulged in the, in the local red wine of Adelaide, as you do when you're at an Adelaide wedding. And I think that's what might have killed any germs the boys that have got, I think. Fair enough. Thanks, Richard. Fair enough. Yeah. Mate, that, that's enough of the stitch-ups. Um, we're about done here with you, Bo. But just one general one. What, for you, is satisfaction when, you know, you're probably going to go on the circuit more and more, especially if um, Lenny's teeing up uh, Fisher tickets and, and that over the next five <laughs> years. But say in five years' time, what, for you, is satisfactory out of cricket? Oh, I, I think, no doubt, I'd love to I'd win a shield for Tasmania. It's, it's We haven't won one since 2012, and... I've played in two Shield finals now and lost them both. Um, that's obviously a huge goal um, of mine. And I think the most immediate goal is, is to win games cricket Tasmania and put us back in a position where we are a, a strong Shield team. Like you said, we are always classed as a bit of an underdog. And, um, you know, as, as good as that tag can be, if teams are underestimating, I'd love to be a, a bit of a powerhouse in the competition. I feel as we've got the squad building up to it. Um, so first and foremost will be that. And, and obviously, if anything came up at, at a national level, if there was a, a hole to open up, I'd love to represent the country. And um, like I said, I think I'm playing as good a cricket as I, as I have done in my career and, and a really well placed to, to grab an opportunity if it does come along. And um, But also at peace with the fact that if it, if it doesn't, because um, as I said, we've got a lot of very good all-rounders in this country and a lot of very good players, um, if it did come along, I'd be I'd be more than happy to grab it and and you know try and grab that opportunity. But yeah, get, winning games of cricket for Tasmania and and as any cricketer says, I suppose shields and and playing for your country are the two reasons we play uh, this game. Well, Bo, I've admired what you've done. As I said at, at the top, where the way you score runs under pressure, and, and I hope over the next couple of years there's a lot of Test cricket. And you finally get that baggy green and. You talk a lot here, we have about Warner and Lynn organising parties. Mm. Mate, you wait till you get that baggy green. You'll organise your own. You'll have a good time. Things will open up. <laughs> well, I hope so. It would be, it would be uh, yeah, I'll certainly enjoy it. That's for sure. Thanks for the chat, mate. Uh, really appreciate it. And good luck in the games to come for Australia A and whatever else comes your way this summer. Thanks, lads. Loved it. Cheers, lad. Well, that was Willow Talk, our special chat. See you later in the week, heads. All class. Yeah, thanks for watching the Willow Talk podcast on YouTube. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't have to miss an episode wherever you are. And while you're at it, check out these videos up here. They're mostly good.